Everybody. Welcome to another episode of NASA in Silicon Valley Live. I am your host, Tiffany Blake. If this is your first time tuning into the show, the uh, NASA in Silicon Valley Live is a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center where we talk about all the nerdy NASA news you need to know. Um, today with me, I have the awesome Abby Tabor. Hello, Tiffany. Yes, hi, everybody. I am your co-host today, Abby Tabor, and we are simultaneously live right now on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. But if you want to join in the chat and leave questions for our awesome guests today, you need to do that on Twitch. So go to www.twitch.tv slash NASA. So today, I'm really excited. We're talking about space robots. Space robots! Yes. I'm yes. excited. This is going to be fun. <laughs> and we have a couple of amazing guests here today. So why don't we go ahead and meet them? Can you guys tell us your name, what you do here at Ames? Sure. Um, I'm Maria Boilet. I'm a robotics engineer, and I build space robots pretty sweet all right yeah and i'm uh, terry fong i'm the uh, chief roboticist uh, here at nasa ames and i dream up the robots that maria then has to go build <laughs> but awesome job descriptions i know right <laughs> well thanks for joining us you guys um before we get into the show i want to remind our audience about this really cool clock we have here yes exactly this lovely item that we have for you today is our moon countdown clock. So five years from now in 2024, we're planning to send humans to the moon as part of our Artemis program. And this clock is counting down the days, hours, minutes, and seconds until 2024, when the first woman and the next man will walk on the moon's south pole. So pretty exciting. We'll talk more about that later in the show, but if you want to learn more, meanwhile, you can visit www.nasa.gov slash Artemis. Okay, let's get started. Okay, I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think let's start with just the basics. Like, what's the history of, you know, humans and robots in space? Sorry, can you tell us a little bit? Sure. You know, I mean, NASA has used robots uh, in space for a long time to mm -hmm. carry out planetary exploration. We've sent robots to Mars. Um, and we still have robots on Mars today. Right, of course. But um, in parallel to that, there's been this real development um, for actually for a long time of robots that work with humans. Um, mm -hmm. and. It, they are used, uh, you know, outside of uh, spacecraft, like outside of the, the space station. Um, mm -hmm. And more recently, we've been working with robots inside of spacecraft as well. Right, working a little bit closer together, right? Yeah, really. Awesome. So, how about we talk a little bit about, you know, how they work together? Maybe? Yeah. Like what? Yeah. How exactly do robots and humans interact? Yeah, well, I think, I think a great thing about um, when you talk about robots and humans together, it's, it's not just, oh, how, how do I make that robot, you know, just go off and do something. Mm -hmm. But this whole notion of, you know, humans and robots working as a team. And it's something I think um, we're going to see much more of as we go forward in the future. This whole idea that we can use uh, robots uh, to, to work together with humans uh, mm -hmm. to perform work in space or on planetary mm -hmm. surfaces. Uh, and the idea is you might have all kinds of different robots uh, and all kinds of humans working together with those robots. Right. I, I, and, and the same way that a team, for example, a football team has specialists, yeah. you play to the strengths of the different members of the team. So in this case, you play the strengths of the humans versus the robots. Okay. So right. Robots are good at certain things. Humans yeah. are better right. at, at other things. So right. they're not necessarily doing the same, the same job thing. at the same time. Right. Exactly. Yeah. You were telling us earlier about the three Ds. Oh, that's yeah. right. So uh, it it's a pretty common phrase in, in robotics, uh, the three Ds, which is dull, dirty, and dangerous. Uh -huh. uh, those are the cases where you want to send a robot in um, rather than a human. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's something really boring to do, you got to take okay. a whole bunch of measurements. It's probably better to send some, a robot who doesn't mind doing those <laughs> yeah. sorts of tasks. Um, <laughs> or, you know, if it's if it's something where it's, it's a dangerous situation, mm. uh, again, you it's sad, but you might not mind losing a robot. <laughs> not as much. Yeah. Not yeah. As yeah. much we, might, we might mind <laughs> losing a robot. Yes, <laughs> but it's far less than uh, losing a human. Yeah. So. yeah. So could a dangerous job be something out in space, like leaving? Oh, the, sure. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think beyond just uh, dangerous, I mean, there are some things, you know, like Maria was saying, that, um, you know, really plays to the strength of robots. Um, 
you know, there are some things that require moving very large right. um, pieces of equipment or, or other things in space that are, you know, just too massive or too heavy for, for a human to, to, to move. Do. Yeah, and it sometimes maybe it take longer. Yeah, it might to take do. longer right. too. You need very precise placement, right? So yeah. it can place the items very precisely with a robot. Yeah. But just like in any any team, you know, I think if you have a combination of, of, of humans and robots that can work well together, right. you know, that allows you to do much more than just you know any individual thing mm -hmm. or person by themselves. Yeah, yeah. right, Good. and. Um, yeah. An example, I think, of the precision that you're talking about. You guys told us the International Space Station was assembled by robots, right? Well, Is by humans. Human 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 and robots. robots. Yes. Yeah. By right. teams, exactly. Right. Right. It's yeah. always going to be teams. Oh, right. It's a great example. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah. Cool. So we have robots working outside of spacecraft, robots working inside of spacecraft, right? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of those. What are some historical robots that have worked on? Space Station well, or? Well, uh, with uh, Space Shuttle, um, space there was shuttle. Canada yeah. Arm uh, okay. on board Space Shuttle. It's a 50 foot robot arm uh, that was used for things like, uh, which we see right now, ah. uh, used to deploy things like satellites uh, yeah. to very precisely uh, place uh, equipment, for example, when when uh, uh, when we were integrating the space station. Yeah, this this was um, a, this was actually a pretty big arm. It's like a yeah. fifty foot long arm. Wow! And it was able to move uh, thirty two thousand pounds. That's basically like moving a school bus. Wow! You can basically pick yeah. up and move and position a school bus. Right. And in space. maneuver that size maneuver object around. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. a pretty big robot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it could also benefit, you know, to building something like, you know. Yeah. How on Earth was the space station? It was yeah. also able to yeah. move people, too. Right. So hold astronauts in place yeah, when really? they had to. Oh, like while they're working while on While they're something? working, right. Oh, funny. So they don't go floating off when they try Safety to apply first. pressure. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fascinating. Oh, yeah. But it gives, it gives the astronaut that. leverage as well. Oh, cool. So, because right. they're attached. Something to use. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The things yeah. you never think about. I know, right? You need something to push against. Yeah. Exactly. Fascinating. All right. Uh, here's a cool one, Robonaut 2. You guys oh, know yeah. that one? Robonaut yes. 2. So, you know, we, we, we mentioned too. earlier that robots can work outside or inside a spacecraft. So Robonaut 2 uh, was a, a humanoid robot that we sent up a few years ago to the space station. Um, in the picture you can see here, it's holding something which looks like a magic wand, but that's actually um, an airflow measurement uh, device. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it actually has it's a great a name. Wand. Well, the device actually <laughs> is called, the, the, the sensor is actually called a VelociCalc. Huh. Um, it's really meant to, to be used inside the space station for monitoring airflow and here we were doing some experiments to see how a robot like uh, Robonaut 2 could carry out tasks which are normally done by humans. All right, those humanoid yeah. robots can use the same tools as astronauts so you don't have to retool everything. Uh, that uh, VelociCalc uh, instrument is usually used by astronauts so yeah. wow. a Robonaut because it, it has hands can right. actually hold it and use it the same way an astronaut would. Right. And the benefit, of course, of you know a robot for doing this kind of job is it doesn't get tired of holding something, right. mm -hmm. and it right. can do it many times over and over, and it's not going to complain. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> not to say not that like not to say that astronauts might complain about things. I mean, frankly, if I was in space, I I wouldn't care what I would do. I'd say, hey, take measurements of the airflow. Sure, I'll sure, do it all do it. day. Right. All yeah. day. Yeah. Right. Happy to. Thanks. Happy to be yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, what about some current robots in space? That we have um, so uh, there's spheres, uh, which is yes. a, uh, a test bed. Actually, I have a model here. Let me. And this one's near and dear to our heart here at Ames, of course, right? Yeah, it is. Right. So this is a, a model so of the on. spheres, which are currently on orbit. There's yes. three of them on the space station, um, and they've been used as a test bed for guest scientists. So. Mm -hmm. um, Developers, technology developers on um, on Earth, like from academia, mm -hmm. from commercial, um, from inside of NASA, have developed technologies that they would like to fly in zero G, mm -hmm. and so they can actually deploy it on a spheres, which would then fly them around inside a space station. So what nice. we see here um, is actually the mounting point where you can uh, put a payload on. Oh yeah, yeah. These, uh, you know, one interesting thing about these is that they they fly around by using actually carbon dioxide. So there's normally a tank. It plugs into these, and they oh. have uh, little, little nozzles basically, um, which release controlled puffs of carbon dioxide. Oh, yeah. Right. So it basically, sort of these little circular. Really. Right, exactly. Sort of, nozzle. It basically okay, puffs yeah. its way around inside a space station. Oh, cool! Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so, and they've been on orbit for over a decade. Yeah. Really. Wow. Yeah. So you're helping have... astronauts for over a decade. <laughs> <laughs> and researchers here, you know, researchers well. everywhere, yeah. all around the world. Yep. Yeah. 
That's awesome. So, it, yes, it's kind of the size of a volleyball, we've mm -hmm. been saying, right? Yeah. It yeah. flies itself around. It holds experiments. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as, as if that wasn't enough, you guys right. upgraded your spheres at one point, right? Yes. Tell that's us about right. that project. So, um, we had a project called Smart Spheres where we, uh, we wanted to see what we could do to improve uh, the, the compute power on board, the sensing power on board, because they, these were built you know, 14, 15 years ago. So, mm -hmm. um, so the sensors, the, the computer, very old, very right. out of date. Okay. And so we wanted to be able to kind of speed them up and try uh, some robotics uh, experiments on board. Mm -hmm. And so we actually flew this, which I don't know, Terry, do you want to maybe hold sure. that one up yeah. there? Uh, this is a uh, this is a you might recognize this as a smartphone, ah. and uh, um, this was actually a Nexus S smartphone, um, which you probably can't find anywhere, anywhere today. Now, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is I going think back. I actually had one. Okay. Uh. <laughs> yeah, this was really state of the art uh, back in like 2010. Um, <laughs> And you know we had to make some modifications. It doesn't look like the off-the-shelf thing. Although I will say this started off, um, you know, at a local electronics store. It was actually purchased um, really? in an electronics store. Walk in the store we, and we bought a phone. In, we bought this. This is what we need. Yeah, we <laughs> say we need one of these here. Um, and Can we, you we, sign this certificate? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so we, had, we had to make some modifications. Um, you know, you, you know, you worry about uh, obviously people worry about breaking their smartphones and you know right, they, they cover their screens. And of course we worry about that, but we didn't want the shards if there were any to fly so off. Fly, right. So there's, there's actually some Teflon tape on here. Um, it's got this very, you know, sort of sleek battery pack here because we had some concerns about putting a lithium, you know, ba um, battery pack into space and those kinds yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. But the great thing about this is it's very compact. It gave us uh, cameras and uh, built-in accelerometers. Mm -hmm. It has high bandwidth uh, okay. wireless data transfer. Oh, yeah. Um, so all, these great, all, all these great kind of things. It's sort, of like sort of like the ultimate brain upgrade um, <laughs> right. you know, to, to a robot. <laughs> to a robot. Right. Yeah, exactly. How cool is that? Yeah. Next time on Pimp Your Robot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And also, the fun fact about Spheres is that it was based on an idea from Star Wars, right? That's right, uh, yeah. yes. Right? Uh, this is uh, based on the training droid mm -hmm. in the first Star Wars movie when uh, mm -hmm. Luke is learning how to use a lightsaber. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's so great. So, Star yes, Wars inspired. That inspired NASA. that robot. Yeah, yeah. And just to point out, I mean, the, the, this actually came up, um, you know, from the original place where, where Spears was developed, and that was at MIT, and Professor mm -hmm. Dave Miller challenged his, you know, his, his engineering class, so, yeah. hey, you know, Here's here's a thing in Star Wars. Can you build me one? Yeah. I want one from myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Make me one. Yes, please. Students. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. All right, so that's one that we particularly love. Yes. There are a few others that ha are, are currently, I think, on the station mm -hmm. that we could yes. talk about and share some pictures. Um, you showed us before Canada Arm. There's Canada Arm 2. Two. That's, that's right. right. right? I think it's a 58-foot uh, okay. robotic yeah. arm on the ex outside of uh, the space station. and. It's used for multiple purposes, but it also it's used to dock the commercial uh, commercial cargo vehicles. Mm -hmm. So what we see here is it um, it's being used to dock the the SpaceX uh, Dragon mm -hmm. capsule. Yeah, and, and this arm is, is is even as Maria said, it's even longer than the original Canada arm, which was on the on the uh, space shuttle. This one um, also um, is a really big arm. It can actually move, um, you know, eight times more wow, than, than the, the original, original one. Yeah, so it's like you always mm -hmm. want more, right? Well, yeah. yeah. So not just one school bus. This could actually move eight school buses yeah. at a time. Well, because it, it moves space station modules, so right. yeah. it actually exactly. needs to be able to do that. And, and uh, it's really cool the way it can inchworm around the station. So it can wherever it needs to be deployed. Mm -hmm. They sort of it, there are holding spots around right. on the it's, outside of the modules. That's amazing. So it, 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 in, inchworms itself across. Uh, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Inchworms, yeah. that's great. That. I can picture that. Yeah. Well, it's a really cool. fascinating robot because it's actually a collection of, you know, a bunch of different robots that fit together. I mean, there's the big arm itself, mm -hmm. um, but there's also um, a separate uh, set of robot arms that can attach to the end, and those, those arms form the system called Dexter. Um, ah. Or if you like acronyms, it's the the SPDM, the Special Purpose Dexterous Manipulator. <laughs> okay. uh, Dexter, Dexter, Dexter was yeah. Dexter was good. Exactly. Dexter, Dexter was fine. Dexter what do you call good. Dexter? Yeah. Uh, but it basically allows this large arm to have the ability to to do fine quote fine dexterous motion. So you have mm -hmm. two smaller arms attached to this bigger arm, and those go into a mobile base. And so mm -hmm. now you have this big large system that can really move all kinds of things around outside of the space station. Wow. 
pretty handy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> um, what about Simon? Simon mm. with a C. Simon with a C, <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Simon. That, that was built by the uh, German Space Agency and, and Airbus. Um, oh, there and there we see it. Oh, yes. Uh, it Simon. Simon. Uh, it's uh, meant to be a personal assistant uh, to astronauts um, hmm. on the station. So we see him there with uh, Alexander Gerst, who mm -hmm. was a commander on the station about a year ago, last mm -hmm. summer, uh, and they ran an experiment. Uh, Simon actually runs Watson, uh, so it's similar to you know the smart speakers that you know uh, oh. add something to my shopping list or <laughs> oh, yeah, right. you know, play, play my, my favorite, favorite song, song. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. that kind of thing. So, I imagine that's pretty. Yes. and, and the idea is yeah, yeah, the idea is that they uh, it can be helpful mm -hmm. on you know uh, if they need to have a procedure brought up, um, so uh, you know help them with uh, different tasks that they're doing and. and uh, yeah, your personal robotic yeah. assistant in exactly. space. In space, in you just talk to. Yeah. You just, you know, it's voice commanded. Yeah. 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 So that seems handy. It's floating yeah, around absolutely. your space station. Yeah. Call yeah. out what you need from it. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, I think we have another here, Ant Ball. Yes. Ball. The most adorable this robot you've ever seen. <laughs> oh, there we go. Ant Ball. Uh, so Ant Ball was built by the Japanese Space Agency, um, and it's meant to be basically a floating camera. It can move around uh, inside the Japanese experiment module um, and take over some of the sort of videography chores of astronauts. So. Uh, a lot of times, uh, astronauts need to document activities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they're filming other astronauts doing things. And so uh, this little robot can take the, take over that job. Aww. Awesome. Great. Yeah. I have a question here before we go to our rapid fire questions. We're, we're going to take <sighs> yes, as many yes. as possible. Um, but Shamley wants to know, would robots on the International Space Station be controlled by Houston? or command here on Earth, or would they be in the hands of the astronaut aboard the station? All of the above. Yes. Oh. Yeah, yeah <laughs> yes. exactly. I mean, I, just like there's, there's no one perfect robot, uh, you know, for everything, there's there's not one, you know, specific way that any of these robots would be operated, mm -hmm. you know. They could be controlled from, from the Earth, they could operate, uh, you know, autonomously, or they could be, you know, operated also by astronauts. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. And actually, so spheres that we were looking at a minute ago, it does do some things autonomously on space station, right? And to a certain uh, extent, like, yeah. We have video of it docking and undocking. Uh, uh, not no. spheres. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Yeah. We'll although, come to that. Although spheres, you know, the, some of the experiments that we've done with spheres, mm -hmm. you know, we've we've tried to allow it to operate. Uh, um, and fly around inside of the space station right. uh, by itself. By itself. Uh, it can be used to carry out things like uh, interior surveys. It can fly oh, back okay. and forth um, to very specific locations, oh. take readings at those locations, and then fly on. Yeah. Um, we, I, we, do, do we have video of that? Maybe that's what I was thinking of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's see if we can get so. that spheres video. Oh, look, there it is. Yes. Ah. So there you see a smart spheres. This is a. Yeah, this was an, actually a different smartphone. So we, we worked with not just the Nexus S, but this was a Project Tango smartphone. Um, that we, we worked on in partnership with uh, our friends next door over at Google. Um, and here is oh, a picture. Is. This is a, a video here. You can actually see a smartphone on the front of Spheres. It's flying around inside of the space station. Uh, it's actually going back and forward, back and forth, flying in kind of a lawnmower pattern. And this is what Mission Control sees. So hmm. you can see video coming down from the smartphone cameras. <clears throat> you can wow. see uh, what looks like a video game on the right side. You can see mm -hmm. the path that it's flying and the waypoints that it's going back and forth between. So here's flying towards point seven. Um, at the lower right there, there's an image that shows the, the representation of what the camera's seen, that kind of blue yeah. thing. And this allows us to have a really good understanding of the robot um, in its environment and what it's doing at any given time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. That's so cool. So there's your answer to that. Yeah. Um, we have a, a comment from uh, Snow the End says, I, I heart robots. <laughs> well, we do too. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who doesn't heart robots? <laughs> so great. Yeah, there were some others. Qu yeah. Quirt? Uh, Go Canada! Was excited about the Canada arm. <laughs> what are some others? We, we could jump right into our rapid yeah. fire rapid question fire. session. Great. Answer some are quick questions. Ready? Yeah, absolutely. Emphasis on the quick. Yes. Right? We'll try to get a lot in. All right. Tiffany, do you so, have one? Yes, I have one. So uh, let's say for spheres, how long did it take to actually create the robot? To actually design that. Yeah. Uh, well, um, as I said, this this was a, a, a project that started at MIT mm -hmm. with uh, with a, actually an undergraduate engineering class, um, and so the students worked on that um, extensively. That led to a number of different prototypes, and eventually those were sent up to the space station. Um, 
But, you know, the reality is that it's hard to say exactly how long it takes to build something mm -hmm. because you have to design it, test it. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of things for the space station that we're concerned about in terms of making sure things are safe. Right, of course. Um, in terms of, like, materials and how it operates and all those kinds of things. So. Mm -hmm. Um, a fair amount of time associated with that. And then, of course, once they get on the space station, you know, just because you get there do right. doesn't mean you're it finished. Continues. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. In fact, right. for every, single, research every single robot that goes up into space, we're still learning how to improve and, and make them better. Mm -hmm. so. Sweet. That's yeah. cool. All right. Uh, a comment about Intball from Airplane Man 1997. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> I agree. We <laughs> all agreed, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, the JP guy has a question about learning and training to do things like you guys do. Is it possible to learn robotics by self-study and tinkering with machines? What books or resources would you suggest? Uh, yes, I would say I would say so. Robotics is it's a very broad field, so yeah. uh, you can contribute to uh, a robotics project. You know, with a, any kind of background, almost uh, you know, product designers, uh, you know, programmers, uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. So really, it's whatever you love to do. Yeah. You know, what what would you prefer to to do? And then uh, you know, you can contribute then to yeah a, a robotics team. That's awesome. That's good news. You could do a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. and I, I think a great thing today, which didn't exist a few years ago, is there are a lot of online classes you can take in robotics. Mm -hmm. And so I think learning by yourself is totally possible. There are even open source uh, robotics projects that you can contribute to. Yeah. Um, and so I think the important thing is just to get involved uh, and not worry about whether or not this is in a university mm -hmm. or at, at home. I mean. You can build things. your own yeah. robots at home, get a little Raspberry Pi and mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Lego set and <laughs> get started. Yeah. 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 <laughs> nice. Some more. Um, Twitch Prime Quare to your back. I saw the floating square robot assistant Asterby, or maybe it was the other one. I forget the name. The assistant robots testing on the International St Space well, Station. You're jumping ahead. Stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> Wanted to get that in there since yeah. you anticipated yeah. another yeah. robot. And of course, we had the uh, Space TV Net says on the ISS, do they have something they can talk to or ask questions like Alexa or Google Home? And of course, that was Simon. That's yeah. the idea behind Simon. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah, you guys so, yeah, those things are needed idea. there too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Here's a good question Godzilla's asks Can we expect robots to take over the role of astronauts on spacewalks and conduct things such as maintenance? Well, I think you know maintenance is, is one of those things that we really want to see robots, uh, you know, take on an increasing role, mm -hmm. because so much of the time of, of astronauts today is spent doing uh, preventive and corrective maintenance on board the space station. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and so we'd love to have robots be able to take spacewalks. But you know, right now we have these large arms that are actually used to do some amount of maintenance external to the space station mm -hmm. uh, without astronauts. Awesome. That makes sense. Yeah. Do you have another one you wanna hit? Uh, let's see here. There's a question about robotics competitions. Yeah. Oh, yes. yes. Off yeah. to Mars. Which asks. have been on spheres. That's yeah. the question. Many, many That's years. The yes. Exactly. Yes. Yes. This it's audience. called Zero Robotics. All right. That's uh, the question. By, by MIT, <laughs> uh -huh. who developed uh, the, the so spheres. spheres. Exactly. Cool. Uh, and it's a middle school and high school um, oh, no software way. competition. Yeah. So oh, awesome. the preliminaries are done in simulation. Uh, you, you program uh, the spheres to perform certain tasks. Uh, the, so the preliminary rounds are done in the simulation, and then the finalists get to fly their code oh, wow. on the spheres on the International Space Station. Oh, wow, for real. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Middle and high school. Middle and high school. That's so cool. Yeah. 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 Get started early. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I was not sending code to the space station no. when I was in middle school. <laughs> no, I <laughs> wasn't either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't want to say my age, but right. that wasn't the space station. <laughs> <laughs> that cool. might have been part of the problem. <laughs> that was part of the problem for me. Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, well, here's another question here. We uh, for Kali Kama. Uh, do you see a point where robot robotics will be able to perform enough tasks where humans won't be needed um, on the ISS? You know, I, I'm often asked that question about, you know, you know the relative strengths and weaknesses of, right. of humans and robots. And mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, we will always have humans involved in right, space. I mean, partially yeah. it's because, you know, we as humans want to also explore. Um, but it's also the case, too, that, you know, 
we can't do everything by ourselves. And just like any, you know, team, right. um, you know, there's more than one, more than one. one, one person mm -hmm. involved. And I think there'll be more than, you know, one human and one robot and more than just robots. Um, right. Really, I think the future is humans and robots together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. How about one more question from the chat okay. before we, we move on, which I have now lost. Space TV Net. Hello. Wants to know, what animal shape is the best for robots in zero gravity? Is there an animal inspir question. nature inspiration, inspiration? Oh, well. for the shapes that work? There seem to be a lot of spheres. Is there a reason um, for that? Yeah, well, but I think part of that is, you know, we, we like, for, at least for flying robots, to have some sort of symmetry to them because mm. you can fly in any direction in space. Um, sometimes I think robot design draws inspiration from animals. Um, in biology has obviously evolved all kinds of different shapes, different forms, and we like to take, take advantage of that. Yeah. But we also sometimes draw inspiration, you know, as we said, from like science fiction. Um, yeah. You know, the idea that people come up with in, in Hollywood for robots. I mean, sometimes it's like, hey, we should that use that. We should, yeah. That could work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and a lot of times, shape also, um, it depends on what functionality you're looking for. Yeah, so you I build see. it so that it's most efficient at the job that mm -hmm. you're, you want to accomplish. Right. So that, that's what drives it. That yeah. drives the, yeah, the shape. Definitely. All right. Yeah, yeah that makes right. sense. Makes, yeah. Well, speaking of science fiction, okay, my question for you oh. is we see robots all over in movies and TV shows, comics, everything. What are your favorites? Oh, that's easy. I mean, for me, you know, my favorite robot is uh, K9, mm -hmm. uh, which comes from Doctor Who. Yeah, uh, K9 yeah. was uh, the doctor's robot dog, and uh, it had basically, you know, a supercomputer built in inside and a little laser that in, in its <laughs> nose. But um, yeah, K9, no have, question. Have you built a dog robot yet? I have not, um, <laughs> but if somebody Are you had one, to? you know. <laughs> I have to say that one of our previous robots in our group was that named I, K9. I, I, oh, it was. It was. Okay, after the Doctor Who robot? Yes. Nice. Yes. 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 Excellent. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And I have to say, I don't really play favorites. I don't really have a favorite oh, robot. I'm sorry. Best, I, mean, I have my favorites are real robots. So okay. <laughs> I have some favorites among them. I mean, someone like but, you in your yeah. position, that's fair, <laughs> so. I think. All right. Well, speaking of your favorites, well, no, let's come to that in just a moment. Okay. okay. So we wanted to talk about characteristics. Yeah, like what kind of qualities do you look for in a robot? Yeah. Right? Oh, uh, you know, we look for we look for robots that can really help out, especially when we're talking about humans and robots in space. Together, yeah. Um, to really work well together. Mm. Um, and I think just like here on Earth, there's no single definition of what a team is. Uh, mm. The same is true in space. I mean, in fact, we could have robots that work, uh, say, before humans, or mm -hmm. robots that work after humans, mm -hmm. um, or maybe even in parallel um, or in support. So the idea is that you could have a team in all kinds of you know different uh, settings. Um, and so sometimes we build robots uh, to do things that uh, might take a long period of time, and you have them work either before or after. Mm -hmm. Other times we want robots that can interact um, more sort of like human spa uh, pacing. So just like we're talking, we'd like robots that can react to us too. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you remember the other day Terry told yeah. his comparison to uh, <laughs> like, like raising a kid? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should say that you know, and, and Maria and I, we spend you know all of our time here at work, you know, thinking about and trying to build robots. robots and right, uh, right. you know, sometimes I will admit it's it's frustrating <laughs> because um, it's it's not unlike you know trying to raise kids. Um, we want them that? to grow up to be you know good autonomous team members and to work right. with you right. um, and uh, you know sometimes I'm not sure if it's more or less challenging than trying to build robots to do the same thing <laughs> um, I will say that my my kids have grown up to be you know far more uh, autonomous and independent right. than my robots, than robots. <laughs> that's a little bit of just a disappointment because I want my robots to oh, do no. as well just as well, right. just as well. <laughs> Yeah. But, one, but one of these days. There are certainly <laughs> times when you say, why did it do that? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Speaking, you know, right. As a father, I would say, yeah, sometimes I look at my kids like, why did they? Uh, but anyway. Why did, they, why did my robot behave that way? Yeah. Why did my robot vacuum cleaner yeah. choose to get wedged under the couch? Right. 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 Yeah. What was it thinking? <laughs> I love that. The day in the life of building robots. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. It's amazing. Own. Well, should we talk about one of your my favorite real robots? Yes, Let's talk about real robot. Let's talk about my favorite robot, robot yeah. which is Astro B. Uh, Astro B. Like so for you Astro B fans. And we just have one right here. That's right. This is what we call this our stunt double. The stunt double yeah. for Astro B. Um, what's, what's the name of the stunt okay, so, double? Okay, <laughs> so um, 
in general, uh, these robots are called Astrobe or mm -hmm. Astrobees, uh, but they each have uh, their own name and, and the color. Yes. So uh, this stunt double model you see is, you know, let me turn it so you can see the color better, ah. is orange um, and is called Killer. Killer B. Killer B. <laughs> um, but we also have three of these um, on Space Station currently, mm -hmm. and uh, they are named uh, Bumble, which is blue, Honey, which is yellow, and Queen, which is green. So cute. So, uh, so when we reference. see them, we see them yeah. on camera, we always know which one it is of based course. on the color. Yeah. So yeah, so this is this is my my favorite robot. Um, we just finished building these <laughs> and launching yeah. them. Yeah, they're um, very exciting. Yeah, and full, exciting full year disclosure for the here, it's Maria's favorite robot because the past four years of my life, life oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's been working <laughs> nothing on, but ask for me. Huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Fair enough. So when That's you know topic. you ask how long it takes to build something, well, Astrobe, well, it's been now almost five years since mm. we started, but That's um, true. but mm. we, I mean, we finished building them and launching them within those five years. So okay. so they're and they're now starting to operate within yeah. those five years. So about like little over four years to build mm -hmm. uh, the, the actual flight units. All right. Um, and so I can I can tell you a little bit about how these work. Yeah, like, usually the number one question I get when talking about Astrobe is was how do they move in, in yeah, zero-g, right? Exactly. Yeah. So first of all, um, Astrobe only works inside the space station mm -hmm. uh, because it needs air. Ah. It's fan-based propulsion. Um, there are two fans on board, uh, these sort of circular, here, rotate yeah, it again, turn it, yeah. so you can see it better. There we go. Um, the, the circular opening that you see on the side, maybe scooch it. That way, a little. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Steering here, okay. Um, so the, the circular thing looks the like a circular speaker. thing looks kind of like a speaker. Here. That's a there's an impeller fan in there, so that pulls air in uh, and lightly pressurizes the the propulsion module. And then those grills that you see, there's yeah. there's two on yeah. every side, so there's twelve total. That's right. Um, I've seen those Abby's are nozzles. Abby's there's Abby's yeah, fingers me. coming in this right. grill. Right. Like um, <laughs> so those are the nozzles, and they open and close, uh, releasing some of that pressurized air. Right. Um, and that's how it pushes itself around the space station. All right. So yeah, it's it's very light pressure. It's only about 0.1 psi over the ambient uh, station okay. pressure. So very safe. It's not gonna you know blow the, up or anything. The astronauts yeah, astronauts don't feel a wind. They will blowing. feel. You'll oh, feel the breeze. They? In fact, we've seen it when it's <laughs> operating on orbit. We'll see like hair moving, oh, really? yeah. okay. little flags <laughs> fluttering. So yeah, you can definitely see. The air is moving, yeah, um, but it's it's not gonna like push them out oh, of the way. Right, They're right, a little right. too massive for this to to push gotcha. them out. Yes. Yeah, cool. All right. So, and then of course uh, the other question we always get is mm. how does it uh, how does it know where it is? You know, how does it mm. move and navigate and not crash into the walls and it, that exactly. Sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and We're the way it does that <laughs> is this, this sort of central white section that you see right there yeah. <laughs> is uh, is the the heart and soul of it. It's the core module. Uh, inside are three um, uh, cell phone class computers, mm -hmm. so pretty much the same as, as your cell phone. Um, and it uses uh, a camera. Um, well, actually, it uses, right. a set, it uses a set of there cameras. There we go, a set of cameras. But the main camera, the navigation camera on this end right there, mm -hmm. um, uh, it uses that camera to look at features inside the space station. Okay. So it has a map that it keeps on board. Um, of features, it knows where those you know features should be in the mm -hmm. station, and then as it's flying around, it compares what it currently sees to that map uh, to right. you know figure out where it is. Say, in the okay. station. Yeah, so yeah. just just like you know humans recognize landmarks to understand right. yeah. where, we're, where we are, this does that, but in a much more precise manner. Yeah, and uh, you know yeah. I, I I think the other thing that Maria was kind of you know pointing at is that we've added a whole bunch of cameras on here mm -hmm. uh, that's really enable it to fly around and know where it is. Some of these are optimized for really sort of like the close-in docking um, that you might want to do with a robot, mm -hmm. where you need a lot of accuracy. Um, and others are for just sort of like free flight, um, where yeah. you're really just trying to worry about, hey, am I going to you know, be in the center of a module or near a wall and, and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. And then the last thing I'd like to point out on this model, um, and part of the main purpose of this robot is to carry payloads. We are actually going to re be replacing the spheres that we saw earlier um, of to carry around other experiments. Okay. Ah. And so uh, uh, there's a lot of open space. Um, you can sort of see my hand coming through right there. All this <laughs> open space here in the bottom and, and in the, the top, top right. allows um, other technologies uh, to plug into this robot, and we will fly you around wherever you want to go in space station. 
Uh, take your experiment, your equipment. Yeah. Uh, we'll take you so around great. space station. How cool is that? So yeah. You can yeah. test I, it I out in orbit. If, if, if people out there have an idea for, hey, I've got a great, you know, mechanism or a sensor or something else that could be built for Astro B, and you can go to www.nasa.gov mm -hmm. slash Astro B, A-S-T-R-O-B-E-E, -E, and you'll find all kinds of information about the Astro B guest science program. Mm -hmm. And uh, that Perfect. tells people about... You know the physical size of the payload bays. You know how you can uh, really develop software uh, for this. Um, and actually, some of some of our interesting experiments are just going to be uh, just purely software that right, people right, write, right. and we upload uh, into one or more of the processors mm -hmm. on board. Do you want to show them the, our payload? Oh, sure. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, we have um, one of the payloads. Um, is is this? Uh. It's a. Uh, it's actually a robot arm. Uh, you can see the gripper here, and we can open the gripper up here. Ah. Um, actually, you can hear the motors. Um, yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a robot. Yeah. Um, can, we hear, can we hear some more of that, yeah. Terry? Oh, sure. it's, it's like the NASA right. ASMR ready? moment of the day. <laughs> it's so <laughs> soothing. I like it. Yeah, exactly. But, um, How cool is that? But this is, this is a payload for Astro just like any other, and it can plug in on the hand of some Maria. I'll just can... show you where it would go. Yeah. Like right in here in the top payload bay. We just slot it in here. Oh, all right. Right. Okay. right? And, and then, then we have a couple of levers here that the astronauts can can switch to lock it into place. Mm -hmm. And so it and so how would Astro be used approaching arm? Oh, so it has it has this gripper uh, mm -hmm. on the front here, and um, you know I can actually open this up here. Um, this is designed to uh, really you know reach in and grab something. Grab so something. You, you can take like a bottle of water. Oh, nice. You can grab the bottle of water here. Yeah. And turn around like this. <laughs> Great. But inside the space station, um, there are all these handrails right, that are so all first, over and... inside the space station, and the astronauts actually Use reach out, the they grab onto them to hold mm -hmm. on, oh, yeah. hold themselves in position or to push themselves uh, mm -hmm. on onto the next area, and we can take advantage of all the handrails there um, for Astro B to grab onto. Um, and that's why we refer to this actually as the perching arm. You know, oh. it's, it's mm -hmm. meant to perch onto it's things really inside the space station. Right. right. When Astro B grabs hold of the handrail, we can turn the propulsion mm -hmm. modules off mm -hmm. and save energy. Ah, mm, okay. so, and how then, cool is that? Yeah, and because there's a camera, we have a high def camera on the front end, um, and the, the perching arm here would be off the back end, Right, we can use this then as a pan tilt unit to point the camera wherever mm, we want. Okay. Yeah. So ah, you can actually yeah, still work, yeah. move the camera, even though the robot is kind of grabbed onto something and right. not flying around, right. you can still point the camera and move okay. the camera around. So it can still be working. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Right. I have a question here mm -hmm. from MDM PhD. What serious mission aspects can be worked by robots such as Astro B? Oh, well, all kinds of things. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, this, in addition to being a, a research platform, um, you know, that's a you know, follow on to spheres, mm -hmm. um, is also for us meant to be something we can test out uh, various things that we would like future robots to do inside of, uh, you know, spacecraft or maybe even future habitats on, on planets. Mm -hmm. So, for example, mm -hmm. um, this robot is going to carry um, a different payload built by our friends down at NASA Johnson in Texas. Uh -huh. um, that's an RFID uh, uh, scanner. So basically, we can go around and use the free flying robot to take inventory mm -hmm. of things that we have tagged with you know little little tags, just um, like in your credit card, just like in your credit yeah. card, or you might see these in the you know, yeah. like grocery stores, um, mm -hmm. just to do inventory. So inventory is a great task for robots. Mm -hmm. Um, another is uh, just monitoring the environment, uh, just trying to uh, assess you know like light levels or sound levels or air quality. Um, and so we could put different sensors onto Astro B and do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, all kinds of interesting things that you can use uh, a robot for to right. really, you know, help take care of the environment right. inside right. of your spacecraft. And, mm -hmm. and kind of freeing up the time for the astronauts, right? Because they spend a lot of time doing tasks like the inventory and the monitoring. And if you have a, rat, a robot doing that... It you know frees them up to do other things, right? Yeah, is that kind of the? the I, I think that's that, the um, purpose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I think I think today um, <clears throat> maybe we'll talk about this more and, and later on in the the show here. But mm -hmm. uh, you know today on the space station, it's a place where we have you know astronauts all the time. It's been continuously manned for a long time now. Mm -hmm. Um, but the astronauts actually spend a lot of their time doing maintenance, a lot of routine maintenance. Um, some of it is just, you know, preventive. You know, it's time to actually, you know, change an air filter. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it is corrective because something broke. Um, and we'd like to try to use robots to help uh, take care of those tasks so that, you know, the astronauts don't have to spend so much of their time, time doing, doing that. that. Right, right, right. Right, right. Yeah, right. Cool. Uh, I have a couple comments about ah. Astro V. <laughs> That's one weird-looking R2-D2. <laughs> <laughs>
to agree. Uh, okay, I want one. <laughs> and, oh, it's kind of like a companion cube. It, yes. yes. <laughs> it's been pointed out to us, the, the resemblance uh, in the past. Yeah. It's yeah. just like yeah. a companion cube. All right. I think um, we have a question here uh, mm -hmm. that says, how do you charge or recharge yeah. the Astro Beam? That's an oh, excellent maybe. question. We didn't even maybe get to can, that. Maybe you could turn mm -hmm. the robot around. And, uh... Yeah, so uh, Astro Beam actually has a docking station on, uh, on Space Station um, that lets us, uh, the robot can actually autonomously plug itself in. So it's kind of your Roomba in space. Uh, <laughs> you know, it can go out and fly these sorties where it takes measurements and uh, does guest science and then when it starts the power starts to run low um, it has a docking port on the back which we see here um, and it can actually back itself into its its docking station and recharge mm -hmm. um, and we also give it an ethernet connection to the space station uh, local mm -hmm. area network uh, right. when we do that so we get a little bit of higher bandwidth on, on uh -huh. communication oh yeah Okay, so you could download any data. It was exactly, the data your, we your just finished videos. collecting. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Should we check out the video of that? Yeah, oh, yes, so we're talking we about some docking, some docking and undocking. Yeah. Yeah, oh, here through. we go. This is so. This is Ast Astrobe's first autonomous undock. Um, we see uh, astronaut David there uh, giving us the play-by-play. -play. That's not a toothbrush he's holding. That's actually a <laughs> microphone. <laughs> Um, and uh, everybody was excited so by that first autonomous motion. And then here we see it docking. This is our first autonomous docking motion. So it just backed itself up into the dock. Uh, we'll see a little light come on telling us that there we go, we've got a good connection. Um, and this was big celebration uh, for us, uh, <laughs> yeah. the team running this, uh, and and crew was very excited too. So we see uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Christina was very excited by that as well. Awesome, that big steps. Yes, yeah. very big steps. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What did the astronauts say about working with Astro B? Oh, we've got all kinds of really, you know, you know, really positive comments from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, for them, really, it's it's a new teammate in mm -hmm. space. Um, That's cool. And uh, you know, I re recall the the first time, um, you know, that Astro B was the, at least the first Astro B was, was unboxed. It was kind of yeah. like like you know. Christmas in space. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, hey, look what I got. I got a, I got a new teammate. I got a new roommate all, all in one. And I can teach it how to actually, you know, be a good good roommate. <laughs> like when you, you, you awesome. know, you get your new cell phone and you're pulling it oh, out of yeah. the boxes. Yeah. Yeah. It was very exciting. Yeah. It's very shiny new. How do I turn it The on? latest thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. It's like, do I have to read the manual? <laughs> can I just play with it? Yeah. Right. So we've certainly yeah. had that. We, When we were first building it, it was very much a concern that we would be good teammates, that we wouldn't mm -hmm. be, for instance, too loud. You know, oh. we want to stay quiet and we don't want to be annoying. With the <laughs> so, fans? What, with the air So blowing? because of the fans, okay. it's going to make a constant noise. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to, you know, minimize that. And so far, the feedback we've gotten from from astronauts is that it's it's very reasonable it's not mm. too loud and it's they actually kind of like it because they can hear it coming you yeah. said some other fun things to say the other day about um, the astronauts are guiding it around, I think, sort of teaching That's right. it to walk, so, you said. Yes. Uh, one of the first activities we had to do is, is build the map of mm -hmm. the inside of the space station. So right? We have models going. on the ground, yeah. but you need to know what it really looks like you okay. know, from the robot's point of view. Mm -hmm. right. So um, astronaut David uh, was uh, actually flying us, manually flying us around so that we could collect imagery data while he was moving us around, because we don't know where we are yet, so we can't yeah. fly ourselves. Right. Mm. So he yet. manually moved us back and forth, and he, he it was great. He said it was like teaching a child to walk. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah. was, that's that so was cool. really nice. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah exactly. <laughs> Excellent. And I say it was really interesting and like exciting watching you guys, you know, do these, you know, tests in the lab here, and just mm -hmm. the excitement. Oh. I mean, the astronauts are excited, and then the team's excited here. It's oh, really, yeah. really cool to experience. Kind of, I was in the back like, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I mean, we, we, we have spent a lot of time, you know, working through the design and development mm -hmm. of, of Astro B, and certainly I think for the team, you know, seeing it in space was just hugely, re you know, really re rewarding. rewarding. It was right. really great to see that, you know, you know actually happen. Yeah. Yeah, I can give you some yeah. breaking news that just yesterday morning, very early in the morning, <laughs> we uh, we had a, a test with Astro B with with Bumble, the blue the blue robot, mm -hmm. uh, flying it around. It flew itself. It autonomously operated. It ran a whole bunch of plans, mm. you know, undocked itself, flew around, came back to dock. Uh, it went really great. Yeah, oh, it was awesome. a wonderful activity. Gosh, yeah. to see that independence, it really is like a kid. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah just a couple months ago. Like, they were, yeah, yeah, you're like, <laughs> David was walking around. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Now it's on its own. Yeah. The thing there is, we don't want to wait, you know, 20 years for it to grow right. up and get a college degree. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, we'd like it to be right. sooner than that. It kind of needs to so, graduate now. Yeah. 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 Robots, yeah. man. Quick, grow up quick. They leave the nest early. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've been talking about how these robots are helping astronauts today, right? So what about looking a little bit ahead? Because right now NASA is busy working to get humans to the moon in 2024. That's the yep, Artemis program. That's right. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe summarize for people what that Artemis is all about? And then yeah, so I mean, Artemis is, is certainly a first step of you know extending human presence beyond just uh, you know Earth and Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our goal here is of course to get people back to the moon um, you know by 2024. And to do that, we're building a number of different systems. You know, new spacecraft, uh, new landers, um, and this really interesting thing called the Gateway. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, um, it's meant yes. to be an, an orbiting sort of mini space oh, station yeah. around the moon. Yeah. Um, and it's a place that we're building not just because we want something to orbit the moon, but it's really a jumping off point yeah. um, to right. go beyond yeah. the moon. And also to be a place where you can you know, carry out experiments uh, beyond Earth orbit, mm -hmm. a place where you can you know, use that to go to and from the lunar surface. Um, but unlike the space station, it's meant to be a place where you know we'll only occasionally be there, at least at first. Okay. Right. And so if you're only there for, say, you know, a few weeks of the year, what happens the rest of the time? Well, yeah, right. it's like having a vacation home. You still need to take care of that. Yeah, have to maintain it. You need to you yeah. know, do caretaking. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, at least in my opinion, I think the very best way of doing that is to, to make use of robots. Yeah, makes you know? sense. Um, you know, maybe they'll be a little mm -hmm. lonely because they're there by themselves. <laughs> yeah. But they can take care of the place. Yeah. Uh, make, yeah. make sure the lights are on. And yeah. we'll talk to them. Yeah. Turn we can the talk heat to them on. from Earth. Yeah, so. can, yeah. they can phone home. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Keep them company. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> we have an animation of the Gateway. It might be fun for people yeah. to see that. Um, and I think you just answered Pluto 09's question. Could you explain how the role of robotics could be on the planet? Yeah, well, you see a robot arm right, right yeah. there. Okay. <laughs> Actually, yeah. we, we talked earlier about robots being inside and outside a station. So, uh, And I think the same thing is true about uh, the Gateway. Uh, certainly, um, we expect there to be an external robot arm. You can see that right there in the animation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think at, at uh, some point in the future, hopefully not too distant future, we'll see robots uh, inside uh, performing some of these uh, these caretaking right. you know, tasks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think beyond that too, of course, you know, here um, you know, at NASA, we have spent uh, quite a bit of time, you know, researching and studying. You know how humans and robots can work together on planetary surfaces. Oh, yeah. Right, you know, other so worlds. Yeah. As we get you know people back to the moon, I fully expect there to be be robots there as well. And right. there, are the idea is that you could have humans and robots uh, doing things on the surface. Maybe the robots are doing scouting. Maybe they're setting up uh, you know infrastructure mm -hmm. like uh, communication arrays, solar panels. Uh, maybe habitats. Help, habitats. Yeah. Have, maybe help, oh, yeah. helping yeah. build landing mm -hmm. pads. Um, and there, you know, really, I think the Honestly, the sky's the limit about the things you can think about or ways for humans and robots to team right. um, as we carry out future exploration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we have a question here from, and you know, to what you're speaking about, Airplane Man 1997. Uh, will we have robots in deep space um, on other planets that will help humans, you know, explore those planets that we've never, you know, explored before? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, we, we have robots today on Mars, but at some point in time, we'll have humans there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think, um, at least right now, the, the current focus on the moon is a great opportunity, uh, not just for NASA, but for, the, for you know, the entire world, world. Mm -hmm. to learn how to really live and work, um, you know, on another planetary surface on the moon. Right. And then we can use all the things that we learn, everything that we've developed and tested, and apply that to other places, uh, mm -hmm. such as Mars. Right, mm -hmm. right. Kind of it's continue started. the teaming that you, you talked yeah, about earlier, exactly. right? On other worlds, yeah. Other strengths. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. Did, did you guys already talk a little bit about the before, in parallel, and after kind of ideas? Yeah, I think yeah. Terry sort of covered uh, yeah. a bit of that with talking about scouting right. and preparing mm -hmm. infrastructure. Uh, sort of the after is you can, uh, you know, crew's only going to be there for a certain amount of time. You know, that the humans will probably then go home after mm -hmm. a few months or a year maybe. Uh, and then you want that the robots will stay behind so they can continue to do some of the work that the astronauts started. Yeah. Uh, for instance, we talked about those tedious, you know, yes, jobs. Yes. Taking lots of measurements so they could go in there and really characterize.
Okay, now go spend yeah, the well, year and, and taking fact, measurements. In fact, yeah. several years ago, we had a research project here at NASA Ames called the Robotic Follow-Up Project, and Maria was actually the, <laughs> the, the project manager for that. Okay. Um, and that was really all about exactly that. You know, we, we sent out uh, some astronauts uh, into the field, and they had handheld uh, you know, cameras and instruments. Here on Earth, I guess. Oh, yes. here on Earth. Yeah. <laughs> in, in an analog yeah, site. It was a, it was a simulated site. It was what we call a planetary analog. Mm -hmm. You know, so a location on Earth that has similar features, features that are similar, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. to places Other that we planets. care about on the Moon or Mars. Um, mm -hmm. And this particular case was in the Canadian Arctic. Oh, wow. Um, this wonderfully interesting place uh, called Devon Island. And on there is a large 20-kilometer, uh, you know, 12-meter or 12-mile or so diameter uh, impact structure, you know, a big giant crater. Oh, yeah. or something and we, hit the earth. We yeah. had uh, simulated astronauts uh, doing um, some mapping work there, some uh, field geology work. Um, and then after they were done, you know, they came back home. We looked we at their. The robots, we sent yeah. the robots. Yeah. <laughs> and then we sent the robots. So the robots followed up okay. after the humans. Hence right. the name, the exactly. robotic yeah. follow up. <laughs> study. And they were able to, like, for instance, to use a, a ground penetrating radar and oh, wow. sweep over the ground. You're just going back and forth, yeah. and basically mowing the lawn <laughs> with, the, with the GPR. So. Yeah, yeah taking you know, thousands of measurements that, that exactly. frankly, would have been really tedious, really, mm -hmm. um, you know, difficult, I think, for humans, for humans to, to right. do. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Very cool. How did it yeah. do? Did it do well? Did it do yes. its job well on its it own? Did. It did. Uh, it slack yeah. off after the humans left? Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, another, another set of readings, really? No. <laughs> I don't yeah. think so. No. We're going to take a break. Yeah. yeah. I mean, robot, robots, um, they, they may run out of energy, but, right. you know. They, they still need care and feeding exactly. as well. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Okay. Yeah, so that was the after example of right. this. Yeah. Before, and, during, and after humans are there, which is kind of like surgery. You told me the other day. Yeah, well, it's, we already it, do it's, this. It's, then. it's like surgery too. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, obviously the brain surgeon's not going to do everything end to end. You right. know, there's someone who's right. doing preparation, the mm -hmm. and they get the patient ready mm -hmm. and the operating room ready, and then the, the brain surgeon comes in. Then you know, does, does the their job. bit. <laughs> they leave, and then somebody cleans up afterwards. Um, yeah. You know, and I, I think. Um, you know the idea that that humans working with robots in space you know it might they might follow that same kind of model you mm -hmm. have robots that are doing things ahead of time and maybe mm -hmm. it takes a long time mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then the humans uh, arrive and do the parts that require humans and you know afterwards yeah. you know, the robots come back and they say yeah. oh, okay now the pesky humans are gone <laughs> <laughs> now i can get some work done exactly Jeez. exactly I've been waiting forever right, right. Yeah. i can do this much quicker yeah. <laughs> right yeah here, here's an example use maybe airplane man 1997 wants to know should there be a robot that follows people around to make sure areas are safe when we're on mars for example mm -hmm. Perhaps the moon, or yeah, there there have been other projects here at NASA that have looked at the idea of of robots doing scouting, where sc mm. where they're really scouting, you know, not you know years in advance, but just ahead of of humans, um, or maybe robots that are just behind them carrying tools or mm. uh, supplies. Oh, yeah, um, I think that kind of you know real time support is also really of interest too. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. all three. Yeah, all right. Um, We've got lots of questions, so we're going to definitely save time for those. Uh, some comments like, the life is yours, calls Astro B. Space Roomba. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've thought of that, too. Um, uh, we've, we've, we've had other comments, too, that, you know, uh, people have said, hey, you know, you, the, the Spheres robots that you guys have been working with, obviously inspired by Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some, some people have said, well, you know, your new robot is a cube, you know, so was that inspired by that other, sh you know, show? <laughs> <laughs> you know, is, it, is, it, is it a mini Borg? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. What are its intentions? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's cube. Yeah. So far, it's been very good. It has, it's yeah. very benign. Very good. <laughs> it, hasn't, it hasn't tried to assimilate everybody. No. <laughs> Exactly. Just want to make that clear. Um, we uh, have a question. Well, we have a question here from uh, Coffee FX saying, "What are the biggest challenges in building a robot designed to operate in a space environment?" Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah. actually, one of our biggest challenges in it, it comes from operating near humans is mm -hmm. safety. Right. Of course. So the, you know, we could probably make a robot that can fly real fast, and mm -hmm. it, but it, it, you know, there are windows on space station, so we don't want to actually so break, break a one. window. Yeah, that would not be good. <laughs> that would not be good. So actually, it's been pretty challenging coming up with a propulsion system mm -hmm. that's very nimble, um, responsive, uh, moves us at like a reasonable rate, can move a reasonable amount of mass, and yet is safe. Right. Um, so, you know, those considerations really make it a challenge. 
Are there, I don't know, are there hardware considerations? Like, does it have to be extra sturdy? More oh, than oh, there's, yeah. there are all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, you know, the, the, the space station environment um, is, is actually a, a nice, gentle environment. I mean, there's, there's, there's very little gravity. I mean, it's, it's really microgravity there, you yeah. know, essentially zero gravity. Um, and it's like an office environment, you know, it's shirt sleeved, it's, you know, it's temperature yeah. control. Right, temperature yeah. control. Yeah. Pretty but, comfy. But, but the problem is getting there. Because yeah, to get yeah, there, you yeah. have to get on a rocket. Right. And a yeah, rocket right. shakes you and shakes you and shakes you. And so some of what we did over the past couple of years was try to design Astro B to survive, really, the shock of being wow. launched to the space station. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So we had to do vibration testing and right. make sure that it still worked after we shook it. Yeah. So yeah. that was, I'm yeah. Really so there are structural constraints, um, electricity, uh, electrical as well. Your systems right. you have to be... Make sure that you're not going to shock any, you know, right, astronaut that touches you, <laughs> yeah. or, or the kind of you know, power bring down any other uh, system on the space station. Mm. So you have to play right. nice with all the other systems on the space station. Yes. So, you know, uh, you have to look at radiate. Like, do you are you radiating noise? You know, mm -hmm. are you going to interfere with the other systems on space station? Mm -hmm. so okay. A lot of consideration. And of course, we control um, astrophy from the ground from mission control. Right. And so that means we're sending, you know, data. Back, and, back forth. and forth, yeah. And on the space station, it's being you know set across the the wireless network, the Wi-Fi network on space station. Mm -hmm. So of course, you don't want to be a network hog either. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> network He's hog. He's on a Wi-Fi speed, man. <laughs> no streaming HD. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah, we do stream HD. Uh, <laughs> exactly. You know, what movie are you playing right yeah. now? Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. What are you watching? Yeah. <laughs> also, I I know I've talked to you guys about this. Um, you know, taking what you guys learned from Spheres and applying that to Astro B. Mm -hmm. um, in your design and testing for, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of our considerations was we didn't want to have astronauts have to put um, these gas canisters into astronauts. That's, mm -hmm. that's a chore that we're adding to the chores then yeah. for right. the astronauts right. to take care of the robot. Mm -hmm. So we made an all-electric system and that can just plug itself in. And, and so the only consumable is electricity, you know, battery power, mm -hmm. yeah, really. Yeah, it's so. got this docking station that can go recharge itself. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I guess the other thing too that we should have pointed out about the spheres is that in addition to this, you know, uh, carbon dioxide propulsion, which is in a little tank that you change out, um, it requires uh, basically these uh, these eight pack of AA batteries. Oh, yeah. Um, and of course, that what that means is that the spheres couldn't really run for a particularly long time. Yeah. You know, maybe an hour or two, mm. and then you know someone's gonna come over and Jeez. change the tank and change the batteries. And so Astro yeah. B, a core part of the, the uh, design was. Let's get away from all that. Let's, right. let's mm -hmm. let it just recharge itself. Right. Well, and then Spheres also was not allowed to operate by itself because the materials are not, uh, are there's some flammable materials. So it had to have human in oversight at all times, all times. Yeah. Right. in case it burst into flame, I uh. suppose. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Hasn't happened. Hasn't happened. Didn't happen. But, yeah, it yeah. didn't yeah. happen. But, yeah. So all the materials on Astro mm -hmm. are either uh, flame retardant or mm -hmm. they're, they're such a small amount that they aren't a hazard, or we cover them with a flame retardant um, material. Oh, yeah. Right. That's pretty cool. Mark. Yeah. Um, you were talking about communicating with the robots, so here's maybe a bigger general question. Are these robots designed to communicate directly with the DSN? And can you tell us what the DSN is? <laughs> so the, the DSN is the, the Deep Space Network. Um, mm -hmm. It's what NASA and, and frankly, I believe all uh, space-faring countries use to communicate to, to spacecraft, uh, robotic or human uh, in space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think uh, as we see robots going to other places uh, along with humans, then there'll be you know more and more use of, of the, the DSN for communications. Mm. Uh, on the space station, of course, we don't use the DSN because okay. it's in Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, we instead use another system. Um, it's called TDRS, T D R S, right. which don't, stands yeah. for. Don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> I was worried you were going to ask me. Yeah, it's a tracking and data relays satellite system, I think. Uh, okay. But basically, it's a set of communication satellites in Earth orbit, and it relays the signals from the space station um, to the ground to, huh. to mission control. Mm -hmm. um, and so we use that to communicate to and from the space station. All right. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's interesting. There, there are uh, dropouts in COM um, between the space station and the ground. Oh, yeah. Um, so we also designed Astrobe to be able to operate through those dropouts when it can't oh, okay, talk good. to the ground. Yeah. So that's you know, the autonomous nature of, of right. Astrobe. Right. It can carry on. So it can carry on doing what it was carry doing. Carry on, yep. carry on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, 
uh, we actually have some questions about career paths into yeah. robotics and things like that. Can you guys kind of share how you got into robotics and, you know, your education? We have people who are interested in, you know, what kind of, you know, programs were you in in school and internships and mm -hmm. things like that? So first off, I might be a little bit biased, but, you know, ah. I think that everybody <laughs> should be a roboticist. <laughs> Um, and uh, I, I think partially is because it is really fun uh, mm -hmm. working with with robots. Yeah. And um, as Maria said earlier, I mean, robotics in, covers lots of different kinds of, of domains, lots of different areas of study. And so there's not one single path that you can go down or have to go down. Uh, you can, if you like, you know, computers. You can be a come at this from a computer science point of view. If you like mechanical design, you know, mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. We need you all. We need you. <laughs> we need yeah. you all. Yeah. 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 Awesome. And somebody wanted to know if you can use programmers. Yes. Uh, well, web de yeah, Alex the Unicat. Do web developers help in robotics? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, Heck yeah. Because one of the key things we, we we worry about is you know how do we understand what the robot is doing and how mm -hmm. do we communicate to that? How do we command it? And so, in addition to building the robot system itself, we'll build user interfaces. You know, all the interfaces that run at Mission Control that talk to spacecraft. Well, some of those are custom interfaces. Some of them are just run on web browsers. Mm -hmm. you know, they okay. might be web applications. Mm -hmm. And so I think the answer is definitely yes. Um, okay. You know, you can get involved. If you do web programming, hey, you could do that for, for a robot, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Good Our news. XGDS system is web-based. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's software designed here, So, right? yeah, we have a, actually a, a ground data system that, uh, that we use for science planning, so mission mm -hmm. science planning oh, yeah. uh, that's web-based. Cool. Yeah. All right. So a resounding yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, a couple of people have asked about the cost of space robots and mm -hmm. when do you consider that? That was the question. Do you consider the cost before or after? And yeah. So, you, you know, in terms of stuff? like, you know, the robots themselves these days, at least for the ones inside a space station, which mm -hmm. is just like being in an office or a home, um, you know, the, the, the components actually are not the main cost. The main cost has to do with the, the time spent developing and, mm -hmm. and, and building and engineering, yeah. the engineering time. But, uh, you know, Astrobee, as Maria said, uses a, a set of basically uh, smartphone class processors. Mm -hmm. um, and we use off-the-shelf uh, software as well. Uh, Astrobee runs uh, both Android and Linux um, mm -hmm. in terms of operating system. And, uh, and so it's not, you know, like we've custom crafted our own unique you know, set of, of, of software. Right. Or some of the hardware obviously is unique. Yeah. I mean, right. Astrobee yeah. doesn't look like anything you'd buy in a store. Right. right. But it's right. machine parts. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or print. But, Actually, a lot of Astrobee is 3D printed. 3D printed. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But cool. if you open it up, a lot of the insides, you're like, oh, I recognize that. I could buy that. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Um, I have one that I like. I'm curious about, too. The JP guy asks, is it possible to create self-sterilizing robots to prevent contamination during exploration? Oh, wow. <laughs> Talk about no, the, the you can have that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, so one, a possible payload for Astrobe in the near future, uh, we had some folks come in to talk to us about um, it's a st equipment for sterilizing oh, really? in, inside the space station. It's basically ultraviolet light, I think, UV yeah. light. Yeah, UVC. Um, U yeah. yeah, UVC, UVC light. Um, that it's basically like a panel of LEDs mm -hmm. that you just go and hold it up against the, or near a surface and the light will sterilize it. Okay. So, yeah. yes. Wow. <laughs> you can cool. sterilize it. I think a lot of people... We can sterilize each other. You know, one astrobe can sterilize the other one. Yes, so. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. I think if people That's go hiking, neat. you know, they do have these uh, water uh, yes. sterilizing I systems. Have one, yeah, oh, you yeah. have one? Oh, really? Yeah. Or Steri pen. Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. basically UV light. Yep. Um, and it's used uh, to kill off bacteria and... Exactly. That could work. It could yeah. work, definitely. Very cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yep. We have a comment here from uh, Wallapo. It's very cool, y'all. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, here's a question from Rast R. Um, are there any crawling robots? Mm. Um, robots that could easily manipulate things rather than flying um, because that uses you know a certain kind of energy? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we saw some of the other robots that NASA has worked with in the past earlier on the mm -hmm. show. Um, you know, I I certainly think that all kinds of robots are needed, needed. for space. Right, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And of course, you know, robots like 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 Robonaut Two mm -hmm. um, that we had a few years ago. I mean, those were designed to be humanoid. Robonaut Two actually um, at one point was going to have a pair of these climbing limbs. 
So, um, oh. well, the legs look kind of backwards, so the knees were kind of backwards, basically. Yeah, it doesn't ah, look, okay. it's not look natural. Right, right. <laughs> so, but, but that would allow Robonauts to really, like, climb all over in the inside of Space Station. So it would have two arms and two legs or mm -hmm. two limbs, and then you could use all four of those to climb around. Now, oh. unfortunately, we, we, we had some, some problems with the electrical system, and we brought Robonaut 2 back down. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe in the future, you'll see systems like Robonaut 2 um, that can climb. Yeah. And, I think and actually, for ground exploration, again, there right. are snake robots and, oh, you know, that... Again, yeah. bio-inspired, you know, yeah. uh, inspired yeah. by insects and snakes right. yeah. and, yeah, all yeah. sorts of things that, that, you know, move across the ground in different ways and are, can be very efficient. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of work developing these uh, sort of bio-inspired yeah. robots. That's cool. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of related to this one. The, the Life is Yours asks, would a robot like the Boston Dynamic ones work on Mars and the Moon? You well, know the ones? You know, Can you describe a little? Yeah, what so that I mean, means? I, I, obviously, Boston Dynamics has, has created lots of really interesting videos mm -hmm. showing their robots doing everything from gymnastics yeah. to yeah. all yeah. kinds of things, uh, you know, with with running and jumping and hopping. And you know, quite honestly, you know, NASA has interest in those things, those kinds of, of mm -hmm. you know robot capabilities, mm -hmm. uh, because there are places that are just not suited to wheels. Um, yeah. There are places where maybe you can't fly if there's no atmosphere. Um, you know, Astro B, for example, does require air, air and mm -hmm. the Mars helicopter requires air on Mars. Mm -hmm. You can't really have that kind of flying robot on the moon um, mm -hmm. without it's atmosphere. Not air, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And while yeah. like the the Boston Dynamics robot um, doesn't require air to move, it's probably designed to operate in air for things like cooling. So mm -hmm. you couldn't just transport that ro that particular robot not as is, oh, as yes. is as to is, the moon. Right. That's a good. Or, point. Yeah. So you'd have to do some redesign uh -huh. so that it would be capable of operating on those other in you know, those other environments. Right. But the method of locomotion certainly, mm -hmm. yeah. We would be we, we're looking at walking and, and crawling robots. And yeah. jumping and hopping and exactly. running. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We'll see. Close Stay that. tuned. Um, a couple people have asked, again, I think it's about Astro B, how do these robots propel themselves in zero gravity in a spaceship? So could you just review quickly? Review, they're, they're okay, taking so in? it's a fan-based system. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this our particular robot, there are other ways of propelling yourself yeah. uh, mm -hmm. inside a space, uh, space station. But um, Astro B in particular is fan based. It has uh, impeller fan. Actually, can we pull oh, it back sure. up? Oh, sure. We'll just bring it back up on the table real quick here. <laughs> All right. So, actually, right there is, might be good. So, I can actually, actually can point, point at things. Yeah. yeah. So, um, again, this circular opening here, there is an impeller fan. Let me move you my head here. Right, right. Yellow oh, yellow pointer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. There we go. This is better. So, now I can actually talk to the microphone. Um, <laughs> so, this circular part here, there's a fan inside here. And that brings the air into this sort of, it's sort of like a box almost on the end of the robot, this, um, this sort of black section. Um, and then it goes, uh, it, so it lightly pressurizes um, the box. And then these grills right here. They look like the vents in your car. Yeah, they look like little right? vents. Um, there's a nozzle behind that, right? Now, the grill is to keep um, astronaut fingers from going in and getting pinched. <laughs> okay. So that's why the grill is there. But um, but behind there are, are these um, uh, nozzles that have uh, flappers mm. that open and close. And so the, it, that lets air out. And yeah. you have that. Different amounts of air. Different amounts, right? You open it a little bit, you get a little bit of air. You open it wide, you get more air. Um, and then so that the air moving out pushes the robot in the opposite direction. This is the whole oh. magic of zero G, right? Yes, it's yes, the, yes. You're floating, and it's the you know equal and opposite reactions. Right, <laughs> so right, right. Uh, that's how we we propel ourselves around space station. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Apollo MG asks, is it gyro stabilized, and what does that uh, mean? It's partially quote gyro stabilized because <laughs> you know you have fans here, and there's actually a fan on both sides, so it's it's counter rotating, um, mm -hmm. and. What's fascinating is that depending on how fast we spin this, you know, we can change how stable it is in space. So as we do docking, for example, and we want to move in very precisely right. um, and very, you know, with very smooth motion, we'll basically spin up the robot. And you can actually hear it get louder oh, yeah? um, oh. and it becomes more stable oh. um, because it's using its fans and how fast they're spinning to stabilize itself. It also gets a little more control authority because there's a little more pressure, ah, a touch okay. more pressure, so it can actually push itself a little bit harder. Right. Uh, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Nice. Ah. Uh, there's 
It keeps coming in. Astro- you know, Astro- we have one question on. from Ill Inc. Um, are robots good for tending the growing of plants in space? Oh, you know, um, this is actually a super timely question. Because, <laughs> well, yeah. So good job. Yeah, three good. weeks ago, I, I went to a NASA workshop on mm-hmm. on how robots could be used uh, to help grow uh, crops in space. Oh. And um, it's fascinating. Um, you think about all the challenges that you know would be associated with doing that. I mean, planting and monitoring yeah. and tending and harvesting and then processing afterwards. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a great area for research and development. Um, not ready today, but um, if we want to send humans, especially in the deep space, right, you know, we can't just package all the food. Right. They're right. not just going to be eating you know out of microwavable things. They're going right. to need fresh food. And um, it's a really, as anybody who's grown anything um, knows, it takes a lot of effort. Mm-hmm. And so I think robots definitely uh, yeah. are needed for that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Some are already being used on Earth um, yeah. to tend oh, okay. uh, crops. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and, to the, tend and, and harvest, actually, there's this, yeah. there's this whole uh, new interesting, uh, you know, category called vertical farming. Um, you know, where people oh, yeah. want to like grow. Um, really, crops inside their homes or their apartments, and uh, in small spaces. In small yeah, spaces, right? right yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. how can you grow vertically? You have all these different like shelves mm-hmm. and like uh, uh, like hydroponics that go into, um, you know, help grow, the plants grow. But the problem is, you still have to take care of the system itself. Yeah. You know, things always get clogged. Things need to get harvested. Um, so, I think we're going to need robots for that. Robots Definitely. for that. Yeah. All right, nice. <laughs> uh, here's an interesting one. Um, phone things asks, what types of prehensile tasks do robots perform in space, i.e., gripping and grasping tasks? Is that something well, you guys so can speak we to? Well, so we already talked about uh, the perching arm. The perching arm, yes. Just, that can grip can, onto things grip. And, and, yes, uh, save energy by doing that. Um, also, we, we've been looking at prehensile tasks that, like, a rover. Oh. For instance, a wheeled robot uh, can do when it's on uh, a, a planetary surface. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, it can dig a trench, right? If you you drive three of the wheels and your fourth one, you just kind of you turn it sideways and spin it a little bit oh, differently, okay. you can actually dig a trench. Um, so, for instance, say you want to lay some cables, you know, that you then bury oh, okay. uh, around the habitat. Uh, you could use the robot to dig the trenches to hmm. put the cables in. Yeah. Okay. And that's kind of a gripping task because it's holding that's, on. With no, the it's other not gri- it's, No, there's no gripping. Pre- okay. It's prehensile, so there's no no so not non prehensile. Oh, sorry, non prehensile. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that's right. I mean, but in terms of, of, of grasping things, you know, we said earlier that Astropy only has a, an arm for perching, mm-hmm. um, but obviously other systems like Robonaut Two, mm-hmm. um, or even oh, on yeah. the you know the the Canada Arm Two with its Dexter system you know, has the ability to really reach out and, and physically interact with things. You know, maybe you're going to try to, to unscrew something or to swap out uh, some module which needs to be changed uh, for repair purposes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, our uh, gripper is pretty limited. Yeah. <laughs> but there Although, are, but they're yeah, developing some. Stanford yeah. is uh, actually developing a gecko-inspired uh, gripper. Gecko-inspired? For, for our, our <gasps> uh, perching our for Astro oh, fabulous. Yeah. It's cool. already actually on orbit. It oh, launched. Yeah. yeah, it just launched. Um, and so they're looking at being able to um, perch on any surface. Yeah, it's so, really, it's really yeah. The, the universal gripper. I mean, you think yeah. about, mm-hmm. you know, geckos. They can, you know, adhere to any kind of surface. Um, this on the ceiling, yeah, yeah. <laughs> little lizards yeah, crawling really on the ceiling. Yeah, yeah, not so not so thrilled about that when they're in in your home. <laughs> they keep the bugs down. Yeah. They do. yeah. Um, so this, this so this new this new robot hand basically is mm-hmm. meant to be the universal thing. So it can stick to any kind of surface, uh, any kind of shape, um, and that's one of the things that over the next uh, several months we're hoping to see tested with Astrobe. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Yeah. 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 Gecko gripper. Yeah. All right. Guess we're gonna have to finish soon, aren't we? Yeah. I think. Um, do you have a favorite question, or should I throw one out there? Uh, you go first. Okay. Pollo Hernandez asks, "How could you perform real-life tests? Parabolic flights, perhaps? That's nearly testing, like with punch punch cards, cost-wise. Well, mm. how would you? How do you test these space robots on Earth?" Uh, well, so Astrobe, we tested on a granite table. It's kind of an uh, upside down uh, air hockey table ha, right. where cool. the, instead of the air coming out of the table, it comes out of a puck. And the ah. robot sits on top of this puck. Oh, okay. So it floats on, it the, puck. Floats on the puck. Oh, right. So um, it's, it's able to slide it around It slides smoothly. around. It's like a frictionless surface, so it can simulate... Uh, what it's like to fly on. Unfortunately, we can only do two dimensions, not three. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we don't have enough thrust to actually lift up off the table. Yeah. Um, but we.
And at NASA Johnson, we have these kind of gantry crane systems um, that are used as gravity offset. Mm -hmm. So you basically have. You know the effects of gravity. So you mm -hmm. attach something, you hang it from it, um, and then basically how you program the crane to move around, you know, simulates it being you know basically in, in zero gravity. Okay. Yeah. It's just that you can't cool. use the propulsion system when you're uh, in a crane. Oh yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. That's yeah. The, the it doesn't, puck, it doesn't right? move it. So it commands the crane to move it as mm. if the, oh. the propulsion system were moving. Okay. That's cool. But, uh, but the other yeah. thing too is you know since since uh, since the comment uh, mentioned parabolic flights and we did do some tests uh, you know a few years ago with spheres uh, mm. the smart spheres. You know, and sort of this, you know, vomit, uh, comet. vomit comet, parabolic <laughs> flights, um, and the flight that they briefly mimic. Yeah, and it's like short. We're talking right? about like 15, seconds, 15 to yeah. 20 seconds at yeah. most periods, and so. You know, from a from an engineering you know point of view, it's really hard to say, okay, let's get ready, let's get ready, and then yeah. that comes and like, what can we learn in 15 seconds? You yeah. know, and you do yeah. this over and, and over. You just managed to and spin and up your fans, and yeah. you're, you're already oh, out of gosh, gosh. Yeah. It's, tough. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really tough. I mean, yeah. it's it's probably the highest fidelity way we mm -hmm. can you know simulate uh, you know here on Earth, right, well, right, on Earth, you know, by yeah, flying, right. but mm -hmm. it's it's sky. really hard. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, I think that's about all the time we have today. Um, a huge thanks to everyone who joined us in the chat today. Um, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.